Good evening, everybody. It's Sister Susie Smith, and it's August the 25th, 2020. Today marks the seventh year that my husband has been gone from this life. You see, we have a problem with depression among us and anxiety and a whole lot of other things that we tend to ignore and say, oh, those can't be in the church if you have the Holy Ghost and if you um, have a relationship with God. Well, I disagree. While my husband was a backslider, he also, when he died, it sent me into severe depression. And what most don't know is that I almost died uh, about six months after he died because I had quit eating and I had lost enough weight that I had gone from a size 16, 18 to a size zero. Um, it was a rough time in my life. But I had to make a decision to live. And when I made a decision to live with the help of a dear pastor at the time and dear friends, I began to force myself to eat because I just quit eating. I just didn't want to eat. So if you're depressed tonight, I'm here to tell you that yes, prayer does help. Yes, reading the Bible does help. But there's no shame in needing additional help. I went to a counselor. I did not take medication. That was a personal choice on my part. I believe if you need it, yes, you should get it if a doc and you should take it and do whatever you need to do to get well. Because just like heart disease or diabetes, I take medication for diabetes. If that's what's required to get you well, then that's what you should do. And in the meantime, I believe in prayer. I believe in asking for people to pray for you. You don't have to share with them everything that's happened, but you do need to get help. Don't suffer alone, and please don't suffer to the point to where you think no one cares, because we do care. And that was tough for me, because after he died, I felt completely alone. And that's a hard place to be. I'm still alone, but it's different now, because I've got to the place to where I am content with my life. Um, I don't need another person to fulfill me. I just need Jesus. Uh, now, I'm not saying marriage is not in the cards for me in the future. I'm just saying it's not my focus. My focus is on Jesus and on doing what he wants me to do. So anyway, enough about that. If you're depressed tonight, get help. And we are going to pray at the end of this for that. So let's go on. We're talking about the principle of keeping the word of God through faith in his word, part three. Okay? We go to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Where it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Or, let me read it to you the way the Amplified Bible says it. Again, it's Romans 12, 1 through 3, and now I'm reading from the Amplified Bible, where it says, the heading is dedicated service. And verse 1 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, dedicating all of yourselves, set apart as a living sacrifice, holy and well-pleasing to God, which is your rational or logical and intelligent act of worship. And do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs, but be transformed and progressively changed as you mature spiritually by the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes that you may prove for yourselves what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect in his plan and purpose for you. For by the grace of God given to me, I say to every one of you not to think more highly of himself and of his importance and ability than he ought to think but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has apportioned to each a degree of faith and a purpose designed for service. So what do we see here? For number one, we see giving ourselves to God as a living sacrifice is pleasing to God and an intelligent act of worship. Two, giving ourselves to God separates us so we don't conform to the world. Three, giving ourselves to God changes how we think, renewing our mind. Four, giving ourselves to God proves the will of God and what is acceptable and good in his plan for us. Five, we must not think we are something we are not. We must humble ourselves. Six, we must think with rational spiritual judgment. 
Seven, we must remember God has given all of us a measure or a degree of faith. Through this, we can quickly see in the Bible, sacrifice is linked directly to our faith. When we give ourselves to God as a living sacrifice, it is the beginning of the journey to become one who walks past the anointing to the Shekinah glory of God. It's not that the anointing is unimportant. If anything, it becomes more important because it leads us to the place where the Shekinah glory of God lives. Giving ourselves to God as a living sacrifice is almost impossible, but we can do this. It will take us being consistent in our walk with God, listening and obeying immediately when God speaks to us. Giving ourselves is easy. It's staying on the altar of sacrifice where we battle. We must win this battle over ourselves. Why would I make a statement like that? Well, it's true, because these battles will be against our own mind and our own body. We have to make a choice and stick with it. Stay on the altar of sacrifice. This is huge when it comes to living a separate life to God. Thanks to Facebook, oh, we have a front row seat to watching people justify living as close to the world as they can get while they try to claim to be in the church. When we start to justify sin, we are already backslidden in our hearts. We must realize it's never been about how close to the world we can get, but how close to God we live. We who live in the realm of how close to God we can get don't waste time on trying to find loopholes in the Bible, but we're focused on pleasing God. This renews our mind. This goes from everything we do, watch, eat, wear, read, even to the way we talk and think. The devil knows if he can get in our minds, he can destroy us. Isn't it time we kicked him out for good? Next, giving ourselves completely to God proves the will of God and what is acceptable, good, and perfect for us. How? Well, everything goes back to spending time with God, praying, worshiping, thanking, and focusing on the Bible. Those things together with sound counsel from the spiritual leaders God has placed in our lives, we will not go wrong. Too many of us have rejected staying on the altar. <coughs> Excuse me. We want to be one going past the anointing to the Shekinah glory of God, but we want it for free. The fire of God will not come down on an empty altar. We must have a sacrifice on that altar. When we do put a sacrifice on the altar is when we are journeying past the anointing to the Shekinah glory of God. On this journey, we must stay humble before God and others. We must never think we are something we are not. Humbleness and humility have escaped most of us. This day and this generation demands that we do whatever it takes to get back to the place of humbleness and humility, walking spiritually, ministering to whomever, wherever we find them. I'm almost scared to talk about this next one. Think soberly or think with sound, rational, spiritual judgment. We have many who have erred on the side of caution for far too long. We must move walking by faith. Yes, we should do this with wisdom, but it's not so much wisdom we're stopped in our tracks. Do something for God. Please do something for God. Lastly, the Bible tells us we are all given a measure of faith. All. What are we doing with what we've been given? Yesterday in Hebrews 11, we read about the great to accomplish great things for God, never having received the promise. We are the ones prophesied of the Bible in Joel. And I'm going to read Joel chapter 2, verses 21 through 32, where it says, Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the canker worm has ate. Mm, think about that for a moment. And I will restore to you the years that the sorry locusts have eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaidens in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever 
shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. We have so many great promises in the Bible, but without action on our part, that's all they will ever be. We must act. We must move. Now is the time, and today is the day. It's time to wake up realizing with the measure of faith we have been given, being filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking in a language unknown to us, we have the power. However, having power is useless to us if we don't learn how to use it appropriately, bringing people to God. We're the ones who've been chosen to live in this day, but will we do what it takes to succeed? We have all the necessary tools, but what good are tools if we never take them out of the toolbox? We must stand for righteousness or we will fall for anything the devil throws at us. We must quit seeing how close to the world we can get. We must start living our lives in a way in which we are a living testimony, seeing how close to Jesus we can get shining brightly, showing others how to live this way. Let's move with our measure of faith, accomplishing great things for God in this day and for this generation. If we are to be people who go past the anointing to the Shekinah glory of God, we must know this book in and out. We must spend time in it. It must resemble the fact that we love it. We've got to understand this. And when we pray, we've got to understand how to pray the word. There's a way to pray the word. There's certain chapters you go to when you need certain things. Tonight we're going to pray Psalms chapter 91. And no, I had not planned to do that. But when the Lord puts something in my heart, I follow him, you see. Follow that nudge because it's so important I get this right. So Psalms 91. And we're going to read it and pray it. But first of all, we're going to worship. Lord, we worship you and we thank you for all you've done today. You've been so good to us, God. You've blessed abundantly. There were miracles waiting that I didn't even know were out there, God. And I give you all the glory and all the praise for what you've done and how you've provided time and time and time again. I thank you, Lord, for good health. I thank you, God, that you've kept me safe through this pandemic called coronavirus. I thank you, God, for those who have not had it or had it touch their families. But, Lord, tonight, those who have, you need to be with them tonight. They need you tonight. You need to wrap your arms of comfort and peace and love around them, Jesus, and hold them and hug them, God. While they talk to you about their loved ones, Jesus, be with them. Give them comfort and peace, I pray. And God, forgive us if we've done anything we shouldn't have done. If we haven't been kind, when we should have been kind. Forgive us. Cleanse us. Purge us. Make us like you, Jesus, and not like us. God, let me always listen to your urges. Forgive me if I haven't, Lord Jesus. Pick me up, Lord. Dust me off and let's start over again. Put me back on the potter's wheel and break me if you must. But whatever you must do for me to resemble you and not me, Lord, I ask for you to do it. Lord Jesus, we ask for you to touch our missionaries tonight and be with them wherever they are, if they're on deputation or if they're overseas. We ask you to wrap your arms of love and comfort around them as they try to figure this new world out. God, give them direction. Give them understanding of what they should do and how they should do it and how to act and react, we pray in Jesus' name. Protect them from danger and harm, we pray, no matter where they are. And Lord, we pray all of that for the evangelists and the pastors. Give them direction. Give them wisdom, we pray, Jesus, so that they know what to do and how to do it. And, Lord, now we're going to pray Psalms 91. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. God, if we ever needed to abide under your shadow, it's today. We need to do that today, Lord Jesus. I will say of you, Lord Jesus, you are my refuge and my fortress. You're my God. I trust in you, Jesus. Surely you will deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the noise and pestilence. You will cover me with your feathers and under your wings I will trust. Your truth will be my shield and my buckler. I'll not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand may fall at my side and ten thousand at my right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Hmm. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high thy habitation. I want to dwell where you are, God. 
There shall no evil be falling, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Because, Lord, you sent your love upon us. Therefore, we know you'll deliver us. You've set us on high because you, we've known your name. Lord, I call upon you. And I, it says, he shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Lord, I thank you tonight for that passage, God. I know that if there are people suffering from nightmares, Lord, that you're going to take care of it tonight because your word says that the night terrors are not something to be afraid of. That we can pray and you'll take them away. We've seen you do that. I've prayed and I've seen you do that for children. Now, Lord, I need you to do it for adults tonight, God. Those that once battled addiction, those nightmares that come back to them and those cravings, we rebuke in the name of Jesus right now, Lord Jesus. Those that are depressed right now, we rebuke that demon of depression and oppression in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we give them the strength right now to stand up and to ask for help. To ask for somebody to wrap their arms around them while they cry and help them get back on their feet, Lord. To give them the tools so that they can be successful in this thing called life and not, not languish in depression. I know what it's like to languish in depression, God. I ask for you to touch them tonight that are languishing in depression or grief. And God, you be with them and we rebuke those things out of their lives. But we know that it's hard, that, that we get so comfortable sometimes wrapped in our depression that we don't want to take it off. It becomes a cloak of comfort. So, Lord, we need it to be rebuked in Jesus' name. We need to replace it with happiness and joy and peace from you, Lord. And we thank you for doing that tonight. We thank you for all you've done for us, God. We give you glory. We give you honor. You're the King of kings and you're the Lord of lords. We pray all of this in the majestic and wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ tonight. Amen and amen. Be blessed, y'all. Have a nice evening.